And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. Creator of the upcoming Zen Never Dies, which we'll be getting into la later to later in this. The one and only, not a captain, but he is Nemo Down. Hi, thanks for having me in this uh, luxurious temple. <laughs> yeah, I, had, I had to get one. I had to get one Captain Nemo joke out of my system. Oh, it's my username on plenty of platforms. Don't apologize. I'm pretty. Sh I'm pretty sure you've heard about twenty. I'm pretty sure you've heard some version of Twenty Thousand Leagues jokes at least once. Oh yeah, no. I actually have to bring it up to people because they make the the Pixar Nemo joke, like the, the the movie one, and I have to correct course with a more literary reference. So I bring it up. I'm disappointed in my co in my cohort's ability to joke. Thanks. <laughs> nope. go the reason why I didn't go with the Finding Nemo thing is because that's a little thing called class. Exactly. I, uh, you will not believe how many people's first message to me on any kind of platform DMs is, Hey, I found you! Which is why I didn't go with that, because I figured everybody else has. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Uh, if I wanted, if I wanted low-hanging fruit, I'd be, I'd be, um, I'd be, he I'd be running a grape farm and grapevine and make ma making my own wine. Now you're gonna like wine. But, a bit of a tradition around here is mm -hmm. to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Oh. So, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Sure. Um, my introduction, much like the product that came out of it, uh, which we'll talk about a bit later, is weird and non-traditional. Not because I got introduced to some weird subculture underground game but because I kind of always assumed I knew what role playing games were about even though I'd never played until relatively late I came into it you know uh, at 18, 19 age wise but up until then um, I had listened to some podcasts of it I knew vaguely about Critical Role I knew you had pages I knew people rolled dice and being a nerd I assumed I'd get into it Sooner or later. It had my name on it to some degree. Um, and at some point, I found out that uh, a few friends of mine were playing their own game. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if it was an established thing. But they called it NDN, which I think was a joke about the anti-DND. Um, which, what it was, basically, is one person is the game master describes everything. Occasionally you roll a d20 and he judges what that means. There's no paper, no pencil. I'm pretty sure he made that whole thing up in like five minutes and it slowly got complex over the seven years we've been playing it. Um, and so I had in my mind, okay, that's the most free form a role-playing game can be. Nothing at all, total imagination, occasionally you roll a die. And I thought, based on that, I think I probably know what Dungeons and Dragons were. Hmm. Until I played it about two years later and found out it's nothing like what I imagined it to be. It's not bad. It's its own form of good that I really had to adjust my brain to. But it was nothing like what I thought it was. It's not what I thought the most popular role-playing game would be. It just... Something about it was very off to me. Um, I still enjoy it, keep in mind. Uh, but it was a real whiplash. And so a couple of years later, I sat down to make my own version of NDN, my own weird freeform game just for me and my, my group of friends. Uh, and when I sat down, I thought, okay, what did I think D&D was before I actually ever got to play it, before I read the rules? Um, what was it that I thought the default of role-playing games was going to play like? And I wrote down a few basic rules and a few basic ideas. And pretty soon got my friends around the table and told them, don't worry about the rules. It's a new system I'm working on. It's, it's kind of weird. It's very complicated. Don't even worry your, don't worry your little brains on it. It's all in my big giant brain. 
you're just going to roll a d20 every now and then, and I'll tell you what happens. Um, they wrote down stats. I took those stats, tore them up, put them in the garbage, and we played a lovely adventure. There were no rules whatsoever, but we had a lot of fun. And in the same way as with the D&D backwards engineering, I took that session and thought, okay, well, that had no rules. But if it did, what rules would make that strange, weird adventure? And through a combination of that and what I took from D&D, I uh, backwards engineered my own system of uh, what rules would form the kind of freeform fun we had. And that was my introduction. Genuinely, when I started designing my own role-playing system, I had played two role-playing games in my life that had an actual you know, book and rules to them. Everything else was randomness and chaos. I got, I gotcha. And that intro, that introduction, I'm not going to say it's the most unorthodox one I've one I've seen because um, there would be recency sure. bias on that front. <laughs> sure. But it does shine a bit of a light in co- in contrast to a cr- a claim that I've had that I've had to put up with for the longest time. What is that? That, be- that being that. D and that D and D and and in general and fifth edition D and D especially is a great introduction to role playing. Oh God, no! Which, um, Who said that? I it's some it's something that I've been hearing off and on for the last few years, and edition wars notwithstanding, because edition wars make me cringe. Oh, mm. I've never really I've never really bought that because of certain quirks that D and D has that. Once you go outside of that area, you ha- you have to readjust to not having. As somebody yeah. who has um, d- who has done a full ho- done a whole lot of teaching people how to play games at my LGS. Mm-hmm. Oh, I see. And it's always interesting and annoying when um when I'm playing a game that doesn't have classes and the and the people at the table assume th- assume that it does. Yeah, people have to unlearn much more than they do need to uh, to learn when they come from when there is such a single monolith game that you can kind of assume everyone plays, and then going anywhere beyond it, it feels like you have to sell people on some weird niche concept, even though those are really equally weird ideas in in both these systems. Uh, but one just got you know got the market loyalty early on. Oh. It's also kind of fun. It's also kind of funny when, when, imagine, imagine trying, imagine having that kind of attitude about, and about any video game genre. Period. Like assume, mm-hmm. like, like imagine, imagine walking into a game store and assuming that all, um, role playing video games are li- are like Dragon Age. Yep. Or Skyrim. Skyrim. It was very brief and nothing as big as the D and D thing, but uh. When no, not Skyrim. A better example is WoW, World of Warcraft. When that had a complete market hold for a long time, any MMORPG coming onto the scene feels like they had to apologize for not being World of Warcraft and be like, "Oh, we know, we're sorry." And here's here's a lot of things that are like World of Warcraft, and here we we changed some things. Really, you could feel the grip that Blizzard had. They still do, but to much lesser. You know, things like Elder Scrolls Online can. Uh, be out and don't necessarily. Oh, WoW, do, to, um, WoW doesn't have it. nearly the grip that it used to, and it's and it's their yeah. own damn fault. Um, Absolutely, it, a recent news has not helped. The recent, a lot of people had the idea that th- that the series of allegations in the last year were was is the is the reason. No, that was ju- that was just a straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah, and a nail in a coffin. Mm-hmm. But. If the if that example seems a little bit ex- extreme, it ki- it kind of is. But the reason I bring that ki- that kind of thing up is be- is because of that assu- is because of that assumption. Um, I think it's also the reason why I roll my eyes whenever I see somebody doing a clickbait article of here here are great games outside of D and D. Um, and it's ge- and it's games that I- and it's games that I've known about in one form or another for years. Mm-hmm. And if I'm really feeling pedantic, I'll um, post a, I'll post a um, image of the Pokemon Slowpoke. <laughs> the 
That is great. That's like those articles that are like five great fantasy books that aren't Lord of the Rings. I'm like five? Really? A whole five books that aren't Lord of the Rings? Is it Christmas? <laughs> Yeah, yeah it feels like the when something has a, a, a real grip. Um, actually, when I, now I'm thinking about it, Lord of the Rings is a little applicable to Dungeons and Dragons because actually, a lot of fans. If, if you if you want me to be a real smartass, that article would should say instead five great fantasy books that aren't Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that had a thing too. Oh. but. The, appro the approach that I've always said is that D&D is not a great introduction to role-playing games. The only thing that D&D is a good introduction to is more D&D. &D. Because you end up... Yeah. It, um, I end up using it for... I end up using that whole world's greatest role-playing game that they like to... that wizards like to use to make the allegory of the cave. Mm hmm But... That's but that's a whole other story. That one that one that I've tread down qu um quite a bit. <laughs> uh, but if you yeah, see the allegory enough. of the cave, you can probably put two and two together. Somewhat, I think I I get the big picture. So that brings me to um the to Zen never dies, which yeah, I have I have seen some people make um make Hollow Knight comparisons, which to a certain degree I can see it. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe, and maybe maybe I'm reading too much into this. What I kept getting reminded of was the was one of was one of the darker um, Hayao Miyazaki works, Princess Mononoke. Yes. That is a spot on. That's exactly right was one of the biggest points of inspiration, especially stylistically, was Princess Mononoke. Yeah. And with within that within that particular inspiration, the vibe the vibe that I the other vibe that I get is a lot of the a lot of the myth a lot of the mythologies and a lot of the folk tales slash fairy tales you might see in Eastern Europe. Yes. That's also very much it. Uh, one of my favorite things about being someone who, if if your uh, main language that you communicate with and read and take out taken in information and entertainment is English, you're gonna come across a certain type of fairy tales. Um, the really um, base baseline stuff that we think of as fairy tales or fantastical old stories is. Um, it's kind of between the Grimm Brothers and Hans Christian Andersen. Mm. They're the two sides. Grimm Brothers don't necessarily have a moral. A lot of them are just things that happen. Some do, but a lot of them are just here are tales people told. And the Hans Christian Andersen is miraculous stuff that has a kind of moral because it all comes from a single author and they can you know sit down and tell you what it's about. When that's your basis, that's a great basis, but when that's your basis and then you go off and read a very weird niche Polish folktale mm -hmm. or uh, there is a wonderful old book of Japanese supernatural occurrences that someone wrote I think in like the, the 15th century and it's all he did, he just sat down Otogi Zoshi all. Mm -hmm. yes, it's all, I, I think I got the timeline wrong, but just a bunch of these uh, the, the, the kind of magical creatures people believed in and those kind of things and when you read those stories even today, if you watch kind of early Japanese cinema, um, there's a weird fairy tale logic because you never know what's going to happen next. It just doesn't follow the structure that you know. You know, it, we come to a point in the story where it's supposed to, you know, a twist is supposed to happen, and it just doesn't because it doesn't work on the same base that you do. Um, Miyazaki's a great example. They have this dream logic where, in Spirited Away, for example, the little girl goes into a whole nother world and there's frog people and all sorts of things. Not once in the book, in the movie will anyone turn to the camera or to her and explain what frog people are. There's frog people. Deal with it. You're in a magical world now. Um, you're not going to get their heritage. You're not going to get their ancestry. There's frog people. Um, and in a lot of ways, that's the fa the how confidently 
those fairy tales just introduce a concept to you that you're completely foreign with and you just have to deal with it. Mm. That feeling of otherness, of being a foreigner in a fantasy world, I drew a lot from that, both in Eastern Europe and in uh, further Eastern mythology. That that has been big for me. Yeah. And I'd say... The other th- the other thing that um, the other thing that I fo- that I found um, kind of kind of interesting is the known wor- the the map of the known world show- showing everything on um, mm-hmm. on an on on an island that a sh- the shape kind of reminds me of the sh- the shape of the UK just turned ninety degrees, but <laughs> I had, well, hold on I need to pull it up now I had not seen that wait. Um, you look at it. It kind it kind of lo- it kind of looks like it kind of looks like the. Oh end. wow, <laughs> that is. Yeah, look at it sideways, <laughs> and you'll see it. <laughs> oh, I see that too. I can't believe I've never seen that before. Nobody's brought that up. That map's been up there in one form or another for a couple of years now. I guess I haven't played with enough British players. Uh, I'm not but British. No. No, not a single person has brought that up. Mm-hmm. But I'd say the ge- the the general vi- the general vibe to to the world of to the world of Zen is the, is the whole, is the fact that gods gods and spirits are real. They can, their um, motivations are not easily understood, and most people, aside from player characters, tend to keep to the keep to the simple life yes that's a very much a a core pillar of the kind of world that it is oh and with the with that kind of thing with that kind of thing in mind when it comes to a issue that can happen with with some worlds that with some um, worlds with a significant amount of detail is how you fit is how you fit in the X factor that is the player characters. Oh yeah, and I've. I'm sorry, cu- go on. I'm curious how I'm curious how you do that with with something like with something like Zen, so that it so that the player characters are able are able to fit within the world. So. First of all, it's a great question that I haven't been asked before, but I didn't have to think about it. Um, one of my favorite things, and this is connected to that in kind of a roundabout way, one of my favorite things that I also drew inspiration from is Avatar The Last Airbender, but for a very specific reason. For a few, but one more than anything. This is leading into the, sp- the forest spirit, isn't it? Um, Not exactly, but that's not a bad comparison. But not exactly. So... The I was also thinking about the spirit of the Lady of the Lake. If you remember that one episode about the the yeah. lake that was uh, filled with trash or whatnot. And yeah. Anyway, but one of the things that they do really well in Avatar: The Last Airbender is they have this vast world, and you can read about it and analyze it. There's countless YouTube videos talking about the the political economic rise of the Fire Nation and whatnot, but The thing that's so great about it is they have this world you can look into forever, but it's still so easy and immediate for them to just introduce you into this one village, in this one place, one country, one rule. This is the village, this is their traditions, and the fact that they're in that part of the world, whatever, the the Fire Nation or the, the Air Nomads or the Water Tribes... That gives you some general information. You may know more of the, the vibe that they have, the kind of themes you'll find. But everything about them individually, you're going to find when you get to there, to that village or that valley or that bridge. It's a beautiful kind of monster of the week, but instead of a monster, it's the, the whole theme. They get to this village. Well, they have the spirit and their tradition, and they don't particularly care about the big political conflict that's happening. It'll affect them eventually, but the world is divided into these small things, and that's how the world has been up until, you know, a few centuries ago. Um, 
And in order to address that, in order to have players be able to plop into the world wherever they want or wherever the GM puts them, uh, the world of Zin Never Dies is also divided into those little areas, those little, you can call them episodes, uh, but they're called in the world domains, little sections, the whole entire, any piece of land, and probably water too, uh, is someone's domain. A domain can be as big as a mountain or as small as a single cave. It can be a village, a city, a port, and each domain has a spirit. Uh, and they don't meddle in each other's business. If you go into this domain, this is the story you're in. Spirits have their own personalities, have their own... They, they kind of set the theme of the area that you're in. And most importantly, they set the rules. Uh, and so with Zen being the, the magic of the world, and players can wield that magic in, in different ways, it can be... They're called towers in the world, but just basically categories, schools of magic. A spirit can really dislike one particular school of magic. And that's going to have effects. It's a lot of fun for GMs to work with because they think, okay, what would this city look like if their spirit hates fire? Mm -hmm. Well, they're not going to be able to be super industrial, you know, uh, if, if anything fire-related is just less effective in this whole place, what would that mean? How would they get this stuff from here to there? How would they smith weapons and armor and whatnot? Um, and so the world can be e at the same time vast and enormous and have centuries, millennia of history that you can read if you want. But at the end of the day, wherever you land, it's that valley or that cave. And that place has a story. And it's only loosely connected to the rest of the world because in the real world, it's mostly how it is. Your village affects you much more than the country you're in unless, you know, world war happens. So take, taking that into into account, I'm cur I'm curious if you've I'm curious if you've ever run um, a game of Z a game of Zen as a hex crawl. A hex I never have actually. I've thought about it, and I realized that I am so I I might be. Uh, the right person to design it, but I could never be the right person to run it. I'll have to get some other GM to do it for me because uh, I have a tendency of uh, pulling unbelievably strange and unexpected things completely out of nowhere, not knowing myself what it's going to do, and then letting the players figure it out. And if they figure it out that it's a portal that leads them to the other side of the planet and it's a you know dimension populated by elephants, I know that I'm particularly uh, <laughs> open to having that happen. Uh, but when designing a world for other people to inhabit, I got to set down more rules. So in a hex crawl, as far as I understand it, because I haven't run one, it's something that you have to be at least a little bit more space-oriented, real-world-oriented. Got to have a bit more of a grip on the real physical geography of what you're dealing with. Or... Could be that I have misconstrued what hex crawls are. I only got it from, I think, one that I've been a player in. Mm. You're it not, might be what I have, have I? Not 100%. All right, then enlighten me. Um, a, hex a hex crawl is a, glorified, is a glorified sandbox. You have players moving mm -hmm. from hex to hex and doing... And and do and resolving um, random events usually on some kind of table that the GM has or multiple tables. I mm -hmm. am the table. And in the and the mo the most that you'd have to deal with when it comes to using using real world stuff is mm -hmm. is some some measurement approximation about what one he what about moving between hexes, like. A lot of cases have it that one hex equals one mile or one day of travel or one hour of travel and so on. It depends it varies from game to game, but that's the general idea. It's not meant it's not meant to be a a um story the way a typical adventure is. It's okay. meant to have a bunch of seeds that you can that you can utilize, but 
though, but those seed, but those seeds don't have a defin don't have a definitive beginning, middle, end the way your tip your typical adventure or module is going to. I see. Is it more about simulating exploration of a space than it is about the specific things being explored? It is more about explo exploring a space. I see. A lot of hex crawl modules will have will have a bit will have a map that's divided into a bunch of hexes in that form. Um, some will just lay a hex grid on a on a map, while others will be a bit more abstract. Mm -hmm. That is that is an interesting idea, and I've seen it around. I don't know if I'm the right person to do it because I I still like to bend distances around for the narrative. Uh, I know GMs vary as to whether they, how much they're going to bend the physical world uh, in order to fit some kind of narrative. Sometimes the only thing that stands between this particularly exciting moment in the game and it actually happening is like one or two numbers on the roll of a die. And it not happening is not it would would help no one nor the story. It would just delay things. Some GMs would just bridge that gap. I think I would be probably personally too tempted to morph things around as a hex crawl. I'd see that, see that set kind of thing, and I'd be very tempted to mess with it. Although, no rules against it. So I might, uh, in the same way that I've changed the standard systems around to fit what I thought was the default of role-playing. Um, I think there's a form of hex crawl that might fit the world of Z&D. Mm -hmm. Probably. I'll have to think about it. But it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. Now that... Speaking of, speaking of the... Speaking of that... Yes. The rule, the die roll system that you have for Z, for ZND is certain mm -hmm. is certainly an unorthodox one. Um, as far as far as looking for a specific range, I'd say the only one, the only D twenty based one I've seen that co that comes close, and even that, and even this is me stretching things a little, is Fading Suns. In, mm hmm. But there's a couple. There's a couple of things that I'm curious about. One of them is the is what gave you the idea for the um rate for the target range that you utilize, and mm -hmm. the other is the is the expectation rule that the that the game has. Okay, so the first one was what gave the idea, and second one was for the fitting. So. When it comes to designing that system, uh, it started linked in a roundabout way to what I thought role-playing games were. And one of the things that I found when I started playing kind of the same way I was listening to podcasts, and one of my favorites was The Adventure Zone, Critical Role was not too far behind. Um, one of the things you pick up really early if you play D&D, just it's it's ingrained into you is that 20 means success and one means failure if you get if you see either a 20 or a one everyone makes some kind of big noise at the table and it, it's a moment that happens and it's a great moment usually it's a great way to to make euphoria out of basically everyone sitting down looking at a die rolling which in itself isn't too exciting um, and I tried that out and players did get excited but I kept running into the same problem, which is because 20 meant success and 1 means failure, players' uh, actions, when it comes to how crazy or unrealistic they were, kind of started stretching upward into unrealistic expectations infinitely. Because up always means better. Up always means success. Numbers so it became... Number, it just became a game of numbers go up. Um... We were talking about World of Warcraft. That's a, a game of numbers go up. The difference between a first level player and a level 60 player is, you know, they may have a lot more different abilities and the particle effects will be really different and the whole style of gameplay. But at the end of the day, n number go up. The one with higher numbers wins. Um, and their uh, behavior in the game got really unrealistic really quickly. Um, 
then I had to start trying to get realism back into it to say, you walk in the forest and there is this a campfire that you encounter. It's still lit. No one around it, but it's a lit campfire. As I approach, I say, all right, the flame morph into this uh, figure of an elephant head. And it speaks to you. It says, I am the spirit of the fire. Stand in my fire and you shall have the powers of eternity. And he stands in the fire and I say, all right, we'll take fire damage. You take that much? All right, well, you've been pretty severely burned. You're going to need to find a doctor. But what do you mean? He said, yeah, he told you to stand in the fire. You stood in the fire, idiot. <laughs> you get burned. You stand the- Don't obey the demon. He's a demon. He wants to kill you. Don't stand in the fire. And I had to run these little things, which they might seem mean, but I was playing with a group that was, we'd agreed beforehand that this is uh, the kind of game that they wanted, one that kind of punishes them for unrealistic expectations. But when I ran it with other players, they didn't really enjoy it. They, they're used to the ND stuff, and when it doesn't happen, you feel kind of betrayed. So I started thinking, how can I prepare their expectations without just punishing them, without just letting them do what they would do by default and punishing them when it doesn't work. It's a good way of teaching, but it's not ideal. People can come up spiteful from it. And I realized I have to change that really basic thing of numbers go up. As long as you are always going to be extremely happy, the higher the number is and super sad, the lower it is, that takes whatever complex scenario we have going on in our session, role-playing, however we're trying to sneak somewhere, convince someone of something, orchestrate a heist, whatever. At the end of the day, we're going to get it down to a pretty binary yes-no, or maybe a gradient at most. Uh, And it dumbs everything down. Not always. Some games handle it wonderfully. But it didn't work for the game I was trying to run. And I gave it a try. I experimented. And I told them... I'm changing the system around. Don't worry about it at first. It's kind of going to be the same as before. But uh, I'm adding an extra rule, which means if you roll a 20, you've overdone it. That's not success. That's actually overdoing it. You've failed upwards. Uh, Which means this. it it doesn't mean exactly the same thing as failing upwards as in you failed, but kind of did it anyway. No, it means you overdid it. And I didn't expect that much of a change because the same player, same GM, same adventure. But there was an instant change. Immediately, the very next time something similar happened, it wasn't exactly a fire demon, but had it been, the moment that came up, he said, stand in the fire. I said, no, they're not going to stand in the fire. One of them came close, investigated the fire, put a stick into it. The stick burned. said, well, the stick's going to burn. I'm not going to stand in the fire. Um... Because as long as the players believe that there is this magical number they can roll, which will, in some uh, unlikely way, solve the situation, uh, that can motivate really unrealistic behavior. Fun sometimes, but also unrealistic behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't, I don't think I would have stuck with that system if I didn't see that immediate change in my players, that they right away switched to the reaction a human being would have when struck in that scenario. They don't want to go near the edge. It might kill them. They don't want to... uh, Suddenly, when someone drew a knife in-game, just a knife, everyone has a moment. Everyone steps back because they know that it's a dangerous scenario. And I immediately, I wrote down exactly everything that happened in in that session, took notes, and developed the whole system out of that one. That's the origin of the system and it's called fitting action because it's not about success it's about the fitting action what's right for the scenario not what's the highest number you can throw at it which definitely definitely makes sense um the big reason that i that i end up getting reminded of fading suns is the is its approach of victory points or what i like to call d20 blackjack Ooh. Um, What's that all about? It's utilizing an at it's utilizing an attribute skill setup. The difference the difference is the the combination that's the hot, that's your cap when it comes to what you can ro- what you can um sa- what you can safely roll under. Mm-hmm. Um, however, the closer you get to that cap, the more victory points you get. I.e., the more de- 
the more degrees of success you have. So you want to go, you want to go as close to the edge as you can without get without going over, and matching it is actually a botch. I see why you call it blackjack. Yeah, that's a fun system. That's a really neat visual way of not visual, but um, it's very simple to explain, mm -hmm. which is uh, you can make the you know the most incredibly fun system in the world if it takes you more than an hour to explain it to anyone. It's that's the, that's a hurdle to get over. Yeah, I like that a lot actually. I'm gonna look into Fading Suns more because I hadn't heard of it before. Um. Until until the Dune RPG that from from Modifus came out, it was the best way to play Dune a Dune like RPG without breaking the bank. Mm hmm. Oh. Now, within, I'd say the I'd say the one thing that I was a bit curious how how the, how things were generated in in char in character creation was the was the was how the stat range is ge is generated and the relationship between that and the wiggle stats. With character creation, is it a case where you where you have some sort of point set up but in it, or is it going to be um the the um st the five stats are automatically allocated based on your choices? So it's going to be. It is in some way a point system, as in you can, if you want to, represent it as point by by putting all sort of modifiers on it. And a player of mine actually has, who's, who's much more familiar with D&D, when I told him how character creation works, he said, why not just do it the way D&D does it? And I said, well, it's not really simpler. It's just what you're used to. And he said, no, no, look. And he started putting an Excel file together and about how all the modifiers would be, and it took up about three pages. And uh, it confused me to look at it, and I, <laughs> I think that that that's a case where I didn't ha really have to make my point. Uh, it was kind of made for me. The way that character creation works with the stats is you have your five stats. You have Zin, which is magic. You have strength, dexterity, constitution, and wisdom. Which, if you've played any game, uh, even with D&D, those are kind of intuitively what comes to you, but I can go more detailed into them later. And you have those. And when you're making your character, you only have two limitations when it comes to where your points can go. It has to add up to 45. Mm -hmm. Whatever you put anyway, it has to add up to 45. And that's significant before anything else because you have five stats. 10 is the average. If someone has 10 in a certain stat, they are what we think of as human average. An average human with 10 stats is, and uh, with 10 strength, is someone who is about, about average, the, a person you'd look at on the street and you know, wouldn't think twice about. But you have five stats and 45 points. So you cannot be average at everything. It is impossible for you to do a character that's 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Uh, you have to start with some kind of compromise. And that's very significant. That immediately puts the players in a more cautious mood where they have to consider their choices. The other um, limitation that you can have uh, in character creation is what species you have. Mm -hmm. When it comes to your top and your bottom, your, your minimums and maximums, five is as low as a stat can go. Five is, if you have five strength, you're about the weakest person anyone's ever met without being dangerously weak, you know, someone who can't stand up or has uh, some kind of physical debilitating condition. And 15 is a, the highest you can go. Depending on what species you choose to play, uh, those are going to be differently limited. So, for example, a hardened. Uh, the hardened species are the largest as well as the most intelligent species. They are real gentle giants, except when they're not gentle. Um, as a result of that, they're the only species that can get to 15 wisdom. Everyone else kind of caps out at 14 uh, or, or 13. They're the only one who can, if they wish to, get 15 points in wisdom. However, because they're so big, uh, and they're, if, you, uh, if you go to the 
uh, Kickstarter page, there's illustrations of all the species. They're really enormous, and their arms are so, so enormous that fine motor action is really impossible for them. So when it comes to dexterity, the highest a hardened can go is, I think, a 9 or a 10. Uh, they, at very most, they can be close to average uh, as, as far as the average human is concerned. Mm-hmm. And so these different species have different limitations when it comes to the top and bottom. For everyone, it's 5 is lowest, 15 is highest. It'll never go below or above those. And um, what was the other thing you asked about the wiggle stat, right? Yeah, and where, yeah, and where that contr- and how that contributes. Sure. So when it came to those stats, I was very happy with the way that came about, with the reactions of players to them, and every every single feature that I added, I was very careful about it because my kind of design philosophy is the fewest possible moving parts. Uh, to the system was my goal, which doesn't mean it has to be very simple. It can still be very complex, but nothing should be there that doesn't need to be there because a player has only so much mental space before they start thinking more mathematically than narratively. And I don't want to go over that hump. Some games, it's really right for them to go over. Not mine. I knew from the start it's not the case. So I had this stat system, and I was happy with it, but... At the end of the day, it was a lot to think of. It was a lot for players to look at. There were five numbers in front of them. They didn't have any clear relationship. They ranged from 5 to 15. And doing quick math in your head between these, multiplying, dividing, whatnot, for some people, it's very easy. For me and other ones, it's it's really not. I, I used to have to take a moment always. And so I divided things up. I thought, okay, when it comes to the world... 5 to 15, I think that's reasonable. All the connections in between, that's how I want to divide people up. Um, to, to still have some nuance in the relationship between people's strengths and weaknesses. But when it comes to a player actually rolling a die, there really aren't 10 different results they're going to get. When you're telling a player to roll a die, the fact that stats can be, you know, if this player is trying to knock a door open... Uh, if they had five strength, or six strength, or seven strength, or eight strength, there's ten options that you can have. But I think if I ran that for the same GM and the same player, and then rewind time and you know change the player's strength by one, there's not going to be ten different outcomes. The GM might have two or three different ones, maybe four, b- based on the general range that the number is at. Well, that's a pretty low stat. I'll describe it this way. That's, that's really high. I'll describe it that way. And so I thought, okay, well, I don't need those stats unless when I really do. So I'll write them down. They're there on the character sheet. They're there whenever you need them if it's something specific. But in the moment, all the GM needs, all the player, I guess, needs to know is what's the range. And that's where the wiggle stat came in. Mm -hmm. So with every stat you have, the wiggle stat, first of all, it's a very fun name. Got lucky with it because it, it was a joke name to begin with, but it... It was memorable for players that I decided it was actually very useful. That's a bit silly. Um, And the wiggle stat is basically the number that's supposed to ease your mind. It says, okay, you've got these five numbers here. They range from 5 to 15. You marked them. You're good. Okay, now forget about them. You don't have to worry about them. Because these tiny little, almost asterisks, numbers next to each of the stats, those are the ones that you as a player are going to use. And those, good news, they only only go from 2 to 5. It can be 2, 3, or 4. It's probably never going to be 5. So that, that's, you know, reserved for way, way out there. 2, 3, 4. Mm-hmm. And those tell you how wide the range is of your fitting action. So if you have 2, you have a pretty, pretty narrow range. It means it's very easy. Um, actually, I should describe what that means before it gets too complicated verbally because it's more of a visual description. Um, So when I described earlier about what the fitting action is, what the you're trying to aim for the middle, not underdo or overdo it, players started aiming for 10. So I decided, all right, 10 is what's expected of you. 10 is fine. If you're a weak character and you roll 10, you did what's expected of a weak character. If you're a strong character, you rolled a 10, you did what's expected of a strong character. 
but your range would still vary. So someone who's average, for example, they roll a 10. They did about average. But if you're average, you've got a lot of room to o overdo or underdo things. If you're really weak, there isn't much underdoing you can do. You know, you're kind of already there at the bottom. And if you're the strongest there can, you can possibly be, if you're the strongest man in the world, you can't overdo something that much if you're trying to do something very gentle. It's very easy for you to overdo it. You're so strong, you'll smash it accidentally. So I was trying to represent that realism in the numbers. And I ended up with this system, which is this. You're aiming for 10 to do what's expected of you. But sometimes you want to do not what's expected of you. You're a weak character physically, but you have to do this thing that's very physically demanding. Well, you're going to try and overdo it. But if it was a strong character, you wouldn't want to overdo it because it'll you know, smash the very gentle bird or whatnot. Mm. And I looked at what players were doing and eventually got it down to numbers, which meant this. Uh, the farther your stat is from 10, the farther you are from average, the more extreme you are, doesn't matter high or low, the wider that your range of fitting action is, which means uh, the more likely you are to do exactly what's expected of you. So if an average character, uh, you'd look at the wiggle stat, it would say something like two. You have 10 strength, two would be it. So that means two above and two below the goal, which is 10 is what your range is. So if you roll 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, you did exactly what's expected of you. Anything below, underdid it. Anything above, overdid it. Mm -hmm. If you become a very, very, if you make a very, very strong character, I'm using strength for all of these, but this can apply to any of the other stats, wisdom, dexterity. If you made one with very high strength, that's going to really expand because someone who specializes is much more likely to hit it on the nail uh, when it comes to what they're doing, but also someone who's very weak. It's much more difficult to do the average when you're extremely weak or even do the average when you're very strong. So the higher your stat is, that range expands. Suddenly it's not two above and two below 10. Suddenly it's three above and three below 10, or even four above and four below 10. Until at some point, this only happened once in a game for me. A player had five, a range of five. So they had literally most of the, not most, but like from six to 15 is all they had to roll. If they wanted to do things the way they wanted it, all they had to roll was somewhere between six and 15. And those are really good odds. Mm -hmm. uh, added on with some bonuses in game. And at some point, some player constructed a scenario where they literally could not, unless they rolled a one, could not go wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, extremely rare, but can happen. Mm -hmm. And usually only once per game. Yeah. And that system, again, I tested out with players and found that it had the exact effect I wanted. It made players uh, cautious. It made them act realistically. It made them take chances they wouldn't un otherwise take. And also... Uh, leave off on chances they sometimes would, it would mean that characters would who are much less likely to die in silly ways because they didn't have a potential 20 to save their ass if they, you know no, I'll put it that way there is a particular moment in what was it? Legend of Zelda Wind Waker I think where it's very early on. They're trying to get into some fortress. They're on a ship. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. These yeah. And they go, well, how are we going to get there? There's lights everywhere. They're going to do it. And they go, well. And he winks at him, and he cuts to Link in a barrel, and they catapult him over there, and he smashes into the wall. That's a viable strategy in D&D. &D. My goal with this system is how do I make this not a viable strategy? I don't want to make it fail. I want to make the players look at that, at whoever suggested that, and immediately kick them out of, you know, kick that NPC down a mountain slope or something. Be like, well, he is clearly insane. Now can we get to the actual planning? And they'll, you know, dig a tunnel or something. Uh, and when I actually saw that happen, this might seem like the most boring thing in the world, but one of the happiest moments I had as a GM is I sat back and didn't say a single thing for about 35 minutes as my players walked through a market 
and got their supplies ready for a journey they were going to take. And one of the players was a suit, which is uh, one of the species in ZND, which are basically slugs in suits of armor. So imagine just a humanoid suit of armor with a little slug head poking out. Mm-hmm. Well, it means that if you're getting preserved food, well, they can't have anything that's preserved in salt. So they got to go around and look for something that's preserved in vinegar or some other way. And they just did this, just wandered around, talked to some merchants, got their you know money in order, money pulled everything together. P- players who weren't mathematicians didn't really like that. Players who thought D and D was too complicated for them genuinely sat down and just did this for their own pleasure for about thirty five minutes. And I, mm-hmm. I had a big dumb smile that whole time because I got them to really have fun with something without going into the realm of you know without having to go into the realm of ridiculous. So when that it does happen, it feels special. When someone does catapult you across the mountain, your heart's going to beat like crazy. That's not a nonchalant decision. It'll happen, and you'll remember it forever. Mm-hmm. Now, Very long answer, but I yeah, hope it helped. Yeah. <laughs> shifting, it, shifting into the magic system that you have... When it mm-hmm. comes to the t- when it comes to the towers, in a roundabout way, because of because of how interpretive it is and how it ver- how it varies from region to region and even from player to player, the one system that I was reminded of, even though I'm pretty sure your system isn't going to be as broken, is Mage the Ascension. Oh yes, and I'm. I'm guessing I'm not the first person to make that comparison, but was is that intentional or is that again a overread on my part? No, 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 it's not an overread at all. Uh, White Wolf and and also Mage in particular was one of the only games I'd played before that I I, I very briefly got to play um, mm-hmm. before getting into designing my own thing. I had a very brief experience with that on one part. Uh, I played some Vampire the Dark Ages, which to this day, that was my favorite campaign I, I've played in, just because our Game Master was a genuine expert on medieval times, and that was a hell of an experience. Um, and some d and certain other things. The thing that is the connection between this and Mage is... Um, so Mage has, to really, really briefly summarize, because I'm, I'm, I'm sure you know, but to illustrate the connection to listeners or whatnot... Um, Mage has these spheres. That's how the magic works. They're called spheres. They're just very, very broad categories of ways you morph reality, ways you influence it. Things as broad as time, forces, life, that actual titles. Um, And depending on how many points you put into them, you can change them in crazy, crazy radical ways. And in their world, in the world of darkness, where werewolf happens, vampire happens, dar- changeling, mages are, I think, canonically, the most powerful ones um, that can you know, change things the most. So when you play it, you really get a sense of how crazy broken, not just broken system, the world is broken. You, know? you see how it breaks in front of you. Um, and I love that game. I really do. And I wanted to take that part of it and give it the same treatment, give it the the Zin never dies treatment of keeping the part that's extraordinary, but making sure it doesn't happen so often that players treat it nonchalantly. Uh, my mage character I played in that campaign was a cloned uh, was a cloned ancient Egyptian pharaoh who was replicated genetically from some DNA samples by technocrats. And they made 10 clones of him. He uses alligator magic. And he he has... uh, What was it? He has like a a cut-off barrel shotgun, a sawed-off shotgun, and a motorcycle. And he drives through Nevada hunting his nine other clones to prove that he is the true prophet of Sobek and his shotgun shoots alligators. That's the kind of character you can make in Mage if you're insane. Um, 
And I didn't want to ban shooting alligators out of shotguns in my game, but I just wanted to make sure it only happens once and that it, when it does happen, everyone remembers it because it's so out of the ordinary. So I took that same idea of having spheres, having general ways of influencing reality, but I made them not quite as broad. So out, aside from, uh, so, so instead of something like matter, I changed into two towers. Well, now it's the Tower of Creation and the Tower of Alteration. And those crazy abilities that you have to really you know, morph existence, well, they're, they can be there, but they're at the very top of that ladder. You're going to have to both work to get up there. You probably aren't going to have that ability. And when you do, it's, it's pretty taxing. So you can use simple things, what you'd call cantrips, of whatever tower you choose. You know, the, if you have the power of fire and just making a little flame in your finger, it doesn't even cost an action. It comes as easily to you as using your wisdom or strength. You just, just roll the die. But when it comes to things above it, you have chosen that tower. You've put that XP there. You have that ability, but it's going to cost you. Mm-hmm. And doing things on that legendary level, they're there, they're possible, but they tax you pretty heavily, which is there to explain, on the one hand, the, the, the magical, mystical property of the world, but also, on the other hand, why things like that don't happen every day, why anyone can function. One of the things I that kind of took me out of the experience in D&D is when I realized, oh, a, a level one character can just show up in a town, you know, like a little village that has regular farmers all around, and just become dictator. So easy. You have cantrip. You can make fire as much as you want. No one can stop you. None of these people can. All you have to do is find a place like, what are they going to do? And so it seemed like, well, obviously, this world is going to collapse within minutes. And, and, well, they, the people who designed it and wrote lots of stuff for it, are not stupid. They figured that out, too. And there's a lot of in-game, in-world lore about why that doesn't happen. Uh, but it's so easy to make it happen because not every GM will have read all that lore. There's nothing really in the system keeping you from doing it. It's all hidden deeper in the books. I didn't want that. I wanted to, for there to be a real physical reason uh, in, the, in the basic rules that you have to play with why this world is still standing, why you can have magic and still have a functional economy. Why you can have people who are able to teleport and carriages and taxis would still be a thing. You know, these things need a reason and they need a simple reason. They don't need a reason that's in page 358 of book number six of your anthology. Mm -hmm. Now, it it is funny that we bring that kind of thing up regarding something like Mage because, well... Um, a game like that has it has its own controls within controls within it, so that people don't get too ridiculous when it comes to magic, and that's the whole reality backlash. Yeah, the the little paradoxes in your brain, mm-hmm. uh, which I like that. I like that control when you have a system that's capable of such extravagant insanity. The only really backlash you can give to it is the universe itself doesn't like it. Um, Which in some small way is also the way that Zin Never Dies deals with it. The spirit of this area is something constraining your magic. You know, there was a great fire here. Then that spirit is going to dislike fire. It's going to be harder to do it here. Mm -hmm. That's a comparison I hadn't really thought about. But it, it probably on a subconscious level, played some part, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Now, the other thing that that I couldn't help but I couldn't help but notice is in regard to how um, how health is utilized. What with the the whole thing with HP and LP. Um, Because of the way damage works, was that was the HP and LP relationship a means to give give some value to low damage rolls? Um, that was exactly half of it. That's exactly right. And also, it played an equal part. 
with the idea that um, I wanted to make it feel meaningful to uh, do things non-lethally and to make it feel very... Um, basically to make lethal weapons feel extremely dangerous as well as making uh, non-lethal weapons also feel viable. Uh, because if your weapons are just a, a scale that goes from basically, you know, numbers go up, mm -hmm. then it's very hard to go into that system and try and make it to play a non-lethal character. So you can have a battle system or combat system that I cannot argue with the results of D&D. A lot of people are having a lot of fun with the combat system in D&D, and that's the reason lots of games take inspiration from that combat system. It does have the adverse result for the story that everyone's a murderer. That is a... It's rare to find a D&D &D character who is not a murderer. Um, and it's not bad for the stories that that game tries to tell. It's not a game that's going to judge you for any kind of murder. It's just, you know, plot important murder. Some, some grunts show up or bandits or whatnot. Uh, when you're making a game where murder, when someone pulling out a knife is a really big deal, suddenly you have a balance to play between making combat fun, but making it heavy, hefty, making it carry enough weight that the players don't frivolously decide to, you know, just kill anyone in the way. Mm -hmm. So the way that was done, I took what I already had with the fitting action system, the idea that you're trying to not roll high as you can, but roll within a range, and applied it to weapons. So for anything in the game, you roll a d20, except for damage. When you're rolling to, to hurt someone, now you're rolling a d12. And what weapon you try to hurt them with, that's going to determine the weapons. Your normal actions have a fitting range, weapons have a lethal range. If you hit within that lethal range, you did a lethal attack. You are hitting them directly, to quote uh, Yugi Moto, you have attacked their life points directly. And, to, and if you didn't, there's a lot of room on that D12 to do you know decent amount of damage, but it's hit point damage. When you're out of hit points, you pass out. When you're out of life points, you're dead. Mm -hmm. If you're passed out and people are hitting you, it doesn't matter what damage it is. It's, it, it's lethal at this point. You have no other points to take away. Um, and that way you can get that balance. So if you're hitting someone with a, a non-lethal weapon, for example, well, that's going to have a really high lethal range, kind of ironically. Because if you think about a D12, if you have your, your 1 to 12 possible results and you're trying to hit someone, then... Oh, sorry, that would have a, a low lethal range. That was my bad. You're trying to hit someone. You roll a D12. I have a mace, let's say. No, not a mace. Let's say just a, a big club. It's not going to cut someone's throat. It's most likely... The most damage it'll do is it'll break bones, for example. But it'll most likely bruise. Mm -hmm. So you're hitting someone. You roll your D12. And say you got... 12. Well, it's a non-lethal weapon. So you hit 12 hit points. You know, they are probably a, a fourth or maybe even a third of the way, if they're very, very small and weak, maybe even more than that, of the way to unconsciousness. Mm -hmm. You did a bunch of their hit points. Or, if you've got that big non-lethal weapon, you hit them, you roll a d12, and you got a 1. That doesn't mean you did the least you could possibly do. You did one point of damage, but that's life point damage. That is a deep bruise or some kind of uh, crack, some, you know, maybe an organ of, uh, of theirs has been injured, the, and it, that's going to take a while to heal. So with a non-lethal weapon, you're either going to do, you know, one, two, three, four of real lethal damage, or a lot of the hit point damage to knock someone unconscious. That's going to be the exact other way around with something like a dagger. Because if you think about fighting someone, you know, hopefully never will, but if you think about some, fighting someone with a small, sharp object, you've got really two options of what's going to happen when you wave it at them. It's very likely you're going to do a lot of flesh wound damage. Little scratches here and there that are going to hurt, that are going to bleed. 
Uh, but they're not going to kill them. Or if you hit some very specific spots, you're going to do an extraordinary amount of permanent damage to that person. You know, a small thing, a small thing that cuts, doesn't matter how small, if it cuts an artery, it cuts an artery. Mm -hmm. And that reflects it in the lethal range. So you're going to do, a, you know, 1 to 10 hit point damage of flesh wound stuff. Or if you roll an 11 or 12 with that, you just did 11 or 12 lethal damage. They're not a third of the way closer to being unconscious. They're a third of the way closer to death. Mm -hmm. uh, and everything in that, in this system, in that different weapons will have different lethal ranges. Some of them will even be in the middle. They won't be top or bottom. They'll be, you know, if you roll a five to eight, it'll be lethal. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of that is to make it so that real world effects can be replicated in a way that's still fun, that's still gamey, that's still an actual mechanic. But it means that if someone makes some kind of real world plan, like, all right, well, I'm going to sneak up and I'm going to knock him unconscious with a blow over the head. And I say, okay, well, that's someone someone could do in real life. How do I make it possible in the game for them to do that? How do I make the numbers make sense? And uh, I'm really happy with the way it came out. The players have been doing amazing with their response to, to the lethal range system. It makes combat impactful, and it does make it so common that it loses its ability. They're never not quite frightened, even when fighting some, you know, low-level bandit that popped out of a bush. Mm -hmm. Now, with all, the, with all that said, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count for the book? Right now, with it... I can very happily say that at the time of recording, it's over 200% funded on Kickstarter with, with 21 days to go. So I can't complain. Uh, right now, I want to get the world book, the rules book, and a decently uh, chunky bestiary all into 256 pages. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very lucky that the rules are a small enough section that there's a lot of space in the book for the world. And it's very important to me that you only need one book in order to play. I understand the market forces that make it so that it's much better to sell people two or three or four books. But I just don't... As a, as a consumer, as a reader, I, I just wish all these games could fit themselves into one book. And, you know sell some other expanded edition. No, it's all going to be in one book, Bestiary, Game Master's Guide, Player's Guide. In one book, if we hit a stretch goal, I won't say the, the price right now because it, it might not reach it, um, but there is a stretch goal to add about 50 pages to the book. Don't know if we'll hit it, but if we will, it's going to be mostly world building and even a small little... Um, potentially a small little example of an area or an adventure in the end. Uh, right now, it's 256, and it's going to be all-inclusive. Mm -hmm. Everything you need to play in one, one book. All right. All right, and then what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date, but a general mm -hmm. um, range, which is a bit... A bit um, in keeping, yeah. In keeping with, in the, keeping with the theme of the, the system. <laughs> So the range is you mean between this point and this point in time, like months? Yeah. Um, I sometimes mm -hmm. I bring up quarters in, in a year mm -hmm. to make things a little easier. Sure. It's going to be, hopefully, uh, the people who have backed on Kickstarter will have it by the first quarter of... 2023 of next year, so about a year from today. Mm -hmm. And about that time, uh, possibly possibly immediately after the last book has been shipped, it will become available for people to buy it. It will uh, show up in several particular retailers, probably the ones... I, I don't know if uh, American or uh, UK retailers will get it, but I know of certain German ones, because I'm here in Germany, who will have a few copies in their stores and it'll be available for online purchase at the beginning of 2023. So mm -hmm. 
between uh, March and April there. Yeah, and I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. And I do wish you the be the best of luck on the on the next few days on the Kickstarter, and to make sure that I don't jinx. <laughs> But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto my show and enjoy the madness at play here. Sure, thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, indulging my ramblings. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> all right, well, I'll mark it on my adventurer's map. Yeah. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!